Good evening, family. Uh, you've tuned in again to another episode of the Journey 2020. And like we say, like to say at the Journey, the Journey is from you to me, and from me to you. Uh, my name is John Robertson. I'm a clinical psychologist, and I've got the privilege of co-hosting this show. Uh, the other part of this team is Charles uh, Morse. And I'm not going to call him my partner in crime tonight because we're going to stay on the plus, on the positive. And Charles, I'm going to simply introduce you as my partner in productivity. Oh, wow. You know, that's <laughs> have I moved up? <laughs> uh, well, listen, you were always up, brother, so you don't have to worry about it. Okay, well, hello, everyone. I'm Charles Morris. Welcome to The Journey 2020. This is part two of Black <clears throat> History Month as we... Uh, we have some knowledge in the house, some wisdom, and are happy to be among friends. And um, our guest today, I've been knowing him for a while. We actually used to work together uh, some time ago. And uh, so we've been doing some things for a period of years. But I wanted him to come on and share some of his stories and some of the things that he's been doing and share some of his writings. And uh, he will enlighten us as well. And, and, and Dr. Robinson, I'm pretty sure uh, you will enjoy. All right. Well, with that start, I know I don't need to introduce uh, Glenn Barbour. And Glenn, uh, one of the things that I'd love your sharing is that I uh, understand that we are fellow uh, uh, expatriates from New York. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> and not only New York City. Not, not only New York, but yeah. we, we got to bring it home now. From yeah. Harlem. Harlem, that is correct. <laughs> right. The village of Harlem. There you yeah. go. All right. Uh -huh. All Absolutely. Right. And, and it's amazing to know that uh, after these years, uh, we always knew that Harlem produced some of our pre premier minds, you know, and uh, uh, and leaders. And it's just a pleasure to again connect with someone who uh, not only survived but apparently thrived with that type of a background. Well, you know, um, Harlem was an, an education. You don't realize how much of an education it was until you're out of Harlem. Mm, okay, mm, you know, okay. while you're there it's it's just Harlem right exactly okay? and right. and when you leave Harlem you uh, get a sense of the legacy of Harlem mm. and uh, the contents of Harlem of Harlem exactly all right? you know exactly. Um, you, you you think about the Apollo Theater in Harlem oh yeah okay oh, yeah. but what a lot of people don't understand is the legacy of the Teresa Hotel Mm, okay. Okay. Which is on a corner of 125th and 7th Excellent. Avenue. Okay. And uh, many years ago, when Fidel Castro came to the United States, and hotels in Midtown Manhattan would not let him stay there with all the chickens he brought. <laughs> right. Okay. The Therese Hotel <laughs> welcomed him there. Okay. Uh, uh, all, right. Right. all right. Now Harlem today has changed tremendously with the fact that Bill Clinton opened his office. On one hundred twenty fifth Street, absolutely. Okay? And nowadays, a lot of the whites who left years ago mm -hmm. are now coming back uh, to Harlem. You know, it's fascinating that you said that because last year uh, I went back to, to Harlem. In fact, went back to the block that mm -hmm. I grew up on, mm -hmm. and I was amazed. It is now what were the old time tenements, et cetera, mm -hmm. are now um, uh, co ops, oh, yeah. and on that same block, one hundred and forty first Street. I heard while I was walking down the block at least six different languages being spoken. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, so it is truly international. The thing that told me that uh, Harlem had changed, though, was when I um, was sitting at an African restaurant on uh, 122nd Street and what was Seventh Avenue mm -hmm. uh, at, at, at 10 o'clock at night, mm -hmm. and uh, was watching uh, an elderly white lady walking down the street mm -hmm. with her little chihuahua. Yeah. And just as comfortable, Amazing. and just feeling Amazing. like Amazing. this was her neighborhood, yeah. you yeah. know, which which yeah. it was. Yeah. And I said to my cousin uh, as uh, we were sitting there, I said, "Yes, I finally ever Harlem has changed." Well, imagine <laughs> this: a white person. Uh, you, you mentioned Seventh Avenue. Seventh uh, Avenue is now called Frederick, Frederick Douglass, Douglass Boulevard. Exactly. But imagine this: a white person living on 122nd Street and what used to be Lenox Avenue, mm. but their address now is Malcolm X Boulevard. Right. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So, so, you know, go figure, as they say. Exactly. But um, I, uh, I love Harlem. Um, 
when I was a little boy, uh, I grew up real fast because mm. you have to. You had to, okay. exactly. But every Sunday, I used to go to the Apollo. Mm. Every Sunday. Oh and it was 65 cents to get in. Oh my. But you had to sit up on the second balcony. And but I didn't do that. Okay. I sat in the fifth row in the orchestra. Oh, okay? all right. And I would, they had five shows, and I would sit there and I would watch. Oh man, the original Temptations. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Uh, I I would Wilson Pickett used to be uh, uh, with a group called the Falcons. The Falcons, okay? that's right. You know, yeah. and I used to sit down and I used to watch all of that and Little Anthony and the Imperials. Imperials, all right. Uh, you know, from uh, the Fort Greene projects in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. So you know, it 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 has such a significant meaning to me. Exactly. Um, and uh, once I uh, uh, found my career mm -hmm. and you know in television news uh, we have to go out into the hinterlands and work our way back mm -hmm. and after many many years of working in different TV markets around the country finally coming back to New York and mm -hmm. coming back to NBC mm -hmm. uh, going to Harlem mm -hmm. uh, was real good and when I um, uh, was able to Gain the kind of respect in the newsroom, whereas my bosses allowed me uh, to do, you know, they believed mm -hmm. that whatever I did would be worthwhile. Okay. So uh, I love doo wop music. Uh, all right. Okay. And as, doo wop. As, as I said, growing up, you know, in that environment, you almost had to. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, with Speed on the Cadillacs. And in the building I lived in, these guys used to sing in the acoustics mm. in the building, man. I mean, it was okay. wonderful. So I actually went back uh -huh. and did a five part series on doo wop oh. in Harlem and was able to get, I don't know if you remember, there was a disc jockey back in the day named Jocko. Oh, yes, absolutely. Right. Yeah. We found, and the, and the thing about NBC, you have a, a wonderful research department. So mm. if you give them a name, mm -hmm. they're going to find him. Okay, yeah. And this was really before computers became computers. Right. Okay. And so I got met with some, some people, and I said, his name was Jocko Henderson. Yes, that's and, right. And two days later, they came in the newsroom, and they say, he's in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Here's his information. So we got a hold of him. We brought him into New York, you know, mm. and we had a guy named Clay Cole, who was a white I, guy. I remember did that, Clay yeah. Cole. Yeah, exactly. And we, we, it was wonderful. We had speed on the Cadillacs. Mm -hmm. We had the Jive Five. Okay. And I took them back to their neighborhoods. Wow. And we that shot, must, we shot them right on the street corners. That must have been amazing. Yeah, and uh, there was a wonderful anchor there by the name of Sue Simmons, mm -hmm. and Sue. Uh, really did all the interviews. We mm. had a show called Live at Five on WNBC mm -hmm. and Sue interviewed. I mean, so it was really a wonderful thing. And I just wanted people to know that regardless of where I was currently, mm. I hadn't forgotten where I come from. Well, you know, that's so important. Um, you know, I, and I want to utilize that a little bit to segue into um, our, our topic, um, and, and that is, uh, and we actually are, are, have been on our topic uh, of uh, black history and, uh, uh, and uh, during Black History Month. And although they said that, um, you know, they gave us the, the, sh the shortest month of the year, <laughs> mm -hmm. but uh, as, as, yeah, as a people, we've always utilized whatever we've been given and excelled at it. Mm -hmm. You know, so with that, I want to ask you a little bit about uh, uh, the black history originally day and then week and then month. And I've heard many of our young people say, well, you know, what's this thing about Black History Month? Um, you know, do we need to know about it? Um, how important is, is it relevant uh, in this day, you know, in the 21st century? And I just want to get your, your thought on that. Well, you know, there's a, uh, a, a, a gospel song called Every Day is a Day of Thanksgiving. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, to me, Every day is a day of black celebration. Okay. 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 Um, it's not, you know, it's it whether it's February, whether it's March. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that black history should be celebrated every day mm -hmm. in this country mm -hmm. because of the history. You know, we were brought to this country in 1619, mm -hmm. primarily to work. In tobacco farms in North America mm. um, and 
here we are 2014. Mm -hmm. If you don't think you have a connection back to 1619, you have a problem. Mm. Okay? Because okay. no matter who you are, whether you call yourself a spook, a <laughs> jigaboo, a Negro, mm. colored, okay. black African American, you have a connection. Mm. You have mm -hmm. a connection. Um, so it's incumbent upon us, not other people, mm -hmm. but us as okay. people of color, mm -hmm. to make sure that every newborn baby, mm -hmm. as they grow, they know the history for which they are a part. Okay. And, and again, I want to pursue that uh, a bit more, And as you said, that there's a connection there. Uh, many of our young people have a difficulty even connecting with what happened uh, last year uh, versus, you know, some things that have happened centuries ago. And um, what, what would you say is, is the, again, the importance of, of at least knowing that connection and acknowledging that connection? Well, I think that sometimes um, we as black people drop the ball, if you will, mm. okay? Mm -hmm. um, you know, young people have got to know, there are a lot of young people who do not know who Ken Chenault is, mm. okay? okay? Ken Chenault has been the chairman and CEO of American Express for more than two decades. Okay. Okay, they don't know that. Okay. I have a close personal friend of mine. His mm -hmm. name is Lord Ward. Mm -hmm. He was the president and uh, uh, chairman and CEO of Maytag. Mm. Okay. okay. People okay. didn't know that. Okay. All right. I have to say, I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, uh, he's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, if we rely upon other people, to teach our people, then we can only expect for them to learn what those people want them to know. Mm, mm -hmm. Okay, so it's incumbent upon us mm -hmm. to make sure that our legacy is continued. And how do we do this? Is that you know, um, with some of these rappers, mm. instead of calling you know women bees, mm, mm -hmm. what they should do is they should be rapping about. Benjamin Bannister. Mm, they mm -hmm. should be rapping about Colin Powell. Okay. They should be rapping about Ken Chinook mm. and on and on and on. Okay. okay. And I think that, you know, uh, as creative as we are, mm. they can add some rhythm to that and we can get down to that. Oh, See what I'm saying? All right, you know? exactly. And, and yeah. let me give you an example. Okay. Um, Years ago, I was working, uh, I had a production company, a TV production company, okay. and I was doing some work for a uh, African-American uh, PR firm in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And um, what they did, a bunch of African-American Wall Streeters got together, mm -hmm. and they created this software mm. um, in cartoon type software mm. for inner city kids mm. about black history. Mm. And so they donated a bunch of them to this public school system in Baltimore. Mm. So my company, we went to Baltimore mm -hmm. to do the story on how these young kids in first, second, and third grade were sent, they donate these computers, the software and everything, and these kids they were really getting into it. Mm, okay. mm. So, you know, you need more programs like oh, that okay. so that we can let uh, our young people know. Mm. Now, we not, 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 that's not to diminish. Mm. Uh, we have some brilliant young people, mm, some mm -hmm. brilliant young minds. Oh, yes. And I think it was evident with what happened with Trevon, uh, uh, um, Trayvon, Trayvon Martin, right. when those young kids went to the Capitol to speak to the governor, those yes, dreamers, yes. those were some brilliant young people. Absolutely. And I say to, I have a, my, my daughter-in-law is an attorney, mm -hmm. her sister is an attorney, and mm -hmm. I said, you know, you all need to go into politics, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. you okay. Know, so that some of these people who are in there now, because these young people aren't afraid to speak their minds. Right. A lot of us are. Yeah. We yes. have a certain mentality that we, we're, we're kind of conservative in terms of what we say. Okay. These young people can not only be firm, mm -hmm. but they, they can really articulate exactly. what they want to say. Exactly. As, as you mentioned, the Dreamers, um, I was so impressed um, 
with uh, the, their persistence and mm -hmm. their leadership, where um, they, they and, and quite frankly, and, and I agree with you that a lot of the older leadership was um, relatively quiet. Yes, you know, and th as the dreamers took on the state capital. That's right. And uh, I think that that's an example. It reminded me very much of um, the early 60s mm -hmm. when uh, the students, you know, at uh, uh, North Carolina uh, mm -hmm. uh, State um, and a number of other co colleges decided that um, they would take the risk, uh, and, and again, the, the nonviolent risk, uh, to uh, desegregate the, the, um, the uh, uh, counters at uh, the various Woolworths, you mm -hmm. know, uh, in the area. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if my memory serves me right, that also happened here in Orlando. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, the, the young people, as, as you said, uh, have been the, 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 the catalyst mm -hmm. in many of the changes that have occurred. And so today we have the, the dreamers, but, you know, I still feel that, you know, as uh, old heads like us, that we still have a role uh, in being able to let these young people know that the kind of things that they're doing, the kind of risks that they're taking, are risks that maybe some of us were not willing to take at the time or not ready to take, but that in our, if you want, want to call it seniorage, that we see the, the benefit and the necessity of taking those kind of risks. Well, I think it's about examples. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, um, uh, fortunately, I've been able to sit down and talk to the president of the United States. Okay, but I've also been able to sit down and rap with a gang member. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. so I think that if you let young people uh, see that. You know, it's not as big of a risk mm -hmm. as you may think. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, we were talking earlier um, when I worked in in Detroit. Mm -hmm. Detroit was known as the murder capital of the nation, mm -hmm. and so what I did was um, I was a producer of special projects mm -hmm. uh, for Eyewitness News, mm -hmm. and so what we did was. Um, my boss had come to me and said, you know, we really need to do some, take a look at the gang situation in Detroit. Mm, okay. Mm -hmm. So I said, all right, I'm gang. Mm, you know? Okay. So I got my crew together. You know, mm -hmm. They called us the Soul Patrol. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we got together and we hit the street. Mm. You know, and we went out one day and these cats were hanging out in the street corners, you know. We got out the car, we had the cameras that was looking at it, you know. So... I'm not going to talk to this street gang leader mm. the same way I talk to the President of the United States. I, I think uh, not. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, and so what happened was I started, you know, you know, talking to them. I started mm. using some of their language, language. some okay. of their words. And they were looking at me like, you know, man, right. what you all about, man? No, right. no, what you all about, man? Mm -hmm. Come on, man. Well, you know, and we started talking and, and so they started laughing at stuff, you know. we So now... They're feeling me. Right, okay. okay. There, there's some connection. There's a connection. Yeah. There you go. Okay. There you go. Right. And so I told him, I said, you know, you know, I come from Harlem. Man, mm. you ain't come from no Harlem, man. We just, just right. Like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. You know, you're one of these bourgeois inners. You mm -hmm. know? It's, no, man. Mm -mm. Okay. No, no. I used to do what you do. Mm. Okay. Mm. Now, if I can make it, you can make it, man. Mm. You know, and so. They invited me and my crew one night mm. to hook up with them. Mm. They're meeting another gang. Mm. Okay. Well, I felt I was very close friend with the chief of police. Mm -hmm. I had to tell him mm. that this was going to go down. Mm -hmm. Okay, because if I had somebody gets killed, you know, you can take your position, but so far. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Well, to make a long story short. Me and some of these guys got together. I invited them to the TV station. Mm. I showed them around. Mm -hmm. I mean, the eyes, they, they were like little kids. Okay. Hey, man, how you do this? So come in, let me show you something, man. Mm. You know, sit behind that anchor desk. Mm -hmm. Cat sat behind the anchor desk. I had the guys in the control room to roll the tape. Mm -hmm. 
and I had them reading some stuff in the prompter, uh -huh. and we gave them the tape. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, um, did I change them on? I doubt it. Mm -hmm. Okay. But what it did, it gave them hope. Okay. That's so important. And I turned hope into an acronym. Mm -hmm. Helping our people endure. Mm. That's hope. Okay. Okay. So I think that that's what we have to do. You know, Jesse Jackson used to say, keep hope alive. Right, okay? exactly. You have to. Yeah. That's more yeah. than just a saying. Right. Okay. There's a meaning to that. Yeah. Well, you know, as, as, <coughs> and, and, and I think that that, um, that is a perfect example of being, uh, being an example and getting out there with young people. So often today I hear some of my, my, my contemporaries, you know, my, my uh, folk my age say, well, you know, uh, uh, I don't know if I wouldn't be feel like those white people, you know, because uh, some of these kids around here, they, you know, they're looking like thugs, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd be afraid of them also. Mm -hmm. And the example that you gave, again, not every youngster is going to react like that, mm -hmm. but as you said, you gave hope. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the things that is absolutely priceless mm -hmm. um, and often can only be done by example. So that, 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 that example that you made, I think is so critical for young people because so many of our folks will, let's say, come from the, the mean streets, but once leaving there, don't go back. Yeah. Don't give back. Yeah. And so I think your, your words and what your actions speak loudly as to what can be done on both uh, on an everyday uh, uh, person level to um, to someone who has achieved like you have, um, you know, to master your craft and be able to to leave a legacy uh, as you as you move on. You know, my wife can tell you something. Uh, years ago, I was a young journal assignment reporter in Augusta, Georgia, mm. and so at that time, uh, TV stations were going from film to video. Mm, mm. And so the way you edit film is a lot different than you edit video. Mm, okay? mm. So they were making a transition in the station. Mm. So what we did one Sunday, we went to the station. My wife had her book and she had some needlepoint stuff. Mm -hmm. And I got on that editing machine mm -hmm. and I taught myself how to edit. Okay. We did. She sat there. We were there all day. Mm -hmm. By the time I left the, the edit room, mm -hmm. I could edit better than anybody in that newsroom. Okay. Okay. And so the thing is, is that how do you adapt to change? Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, technology has changed our mindset tremendously. Yeah. Okay. Yes. You know, regardless of, of what you're saying, I, I look at my business, mm -hmm. television news, technology has changed television news. Mm. The editorial side doesn't change, it's mm. the same. Writing right. is writing, right. but technology changes every day. Absolutely. Okay? And so we have to have these young minds. When I went to NBC, for example, um, I was the only African-American male on the editorial side. Mm. When I went there, they had a couple of African-American reporters that one female uh, uh, producer, mm -hmm. but I was a writer producer, right? Okay. And I wasn't welcome there. Mm -hmm. No, I really wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I remember coming home one night, telling my wife, I said, I, I, I don't like it there because mm -hmm. no one really wanted to speak to me. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, you were more or less window dressing. Well, when I went to NBC. That was the sixth TV station in my career. Oh. So I've been around. Right. I knew the business. Right. And what I found was that the majority of those in the newsroom had never worked anyplace else. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I had to use that to my advantage. Mm -hmm. What I found was it wasn't what you know, it was whom you knew. Okay. That's what it was all about. Okay. It was extremely political. Mm -hmm. And it took me about three or four months. Mm -hmm. I learned that political game. Okay. I beat them at their own game. Okay. You see what I'm saying? So knowing how to play that game gets to be important 
aside from the knowledge base that you have. But you have to have that knowledge. Okay. You have to have that knowledge because what they'll do mm -hmm. is sometimes they'll put you in a position hoping that you would fail. Yeah, oh yeah. Okay, no. Mm -mm. Um, the more foes I have, mm -hmm. the better job I'm doing. Okay. Because see, if you're not doing anything, ain't nobody gonna bark at you. Right, <laughs> okay. right, right. Okay, so I used to go out on assignments, I used to go do things, and people used to go to my boss mm -hmm. and complain. Mm. But you know what I did? When you go to my boss and you complain about me, and my boss starts looking at me, that's what I want him to do. Okay. I want him to look at me, because mm -hmm. then he's going to see what I'm doing. Right. Versus what you're not doing. Uh, right, right. Or oh, what somebody's telling him that, that you're doing. Yeah, you're doing. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you see. Exactly. And so there came a time where the, there was a, a position that it was early morning producing the Today Show. Mm -hmm news in for the, mm. the Today Show. So everybody was vying for that spot, man. Mm. But I said, you know, I'm not going to even try because they no way they ain't going to put me in that position. Mm. Okay. So I was downstairs one, one afternoon having lunch with one of the bosses in the newsroom. We were just talking. We were just talking. And about a month later, they called me in to the big guy's office. Mm -hmm. And here's a whole bunch of them in there. Okay. And I walked in and I'm going to them, I'm saying to myself, oh boy, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, All yeah, right. These cats, so I'm ready for them. Uh -huh. you know? right. So I sat down and uh, my boss, at, the big boss was the late Jerry Nackman, one of the greatest news directors, one of the greatest journalistic minds in the business. Okay. And he said to me, um, he said the the morning producer in the Today Show in local news we want to offer you the job mm. so I said uh, is this April 1st <laughs> I said uh, you know no they said no uh, we want you to produce mm -hmm. the morning local news in the Today Show here in New York City mm -hmm. I said really mm -hmm. he said yeah Okay. and so he said you're going to get you're going to hear some noise he said, but don't worry about them. I'm the one you need to worry about. Okay. Don't worry about them. Okay. okay. And so that was the beginning of, of people doing things. Okay. Mm. In other words, my power in the newsroom, my visibility in the newsroom started to grow. Mm. And I wanted to be better than good. Yeah. I wanted okay. to be great at what I did. Because okay. what that's doing is that, that is sort of paving a way for some other blacks. Okay, okay. that is so in. important. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. you know. And it reached a point where we lived in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. We lived, you know, in a bedroom community in New York City. Right, yeah. So I, 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 I was um, in a production meeting one day with the managing editors and a bunch of other people. Mm. And so the managing editor said, oh, Glenn, you know, we were up in Stanford, Connecticut the other night mm -hmm. because a bunch of people had gotten together because they don't feel as though they're getting a lot of coverage mm -hmm. in southern Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And she said, I want you to know what, you know what we told them? We said, well, one of our producers lives in Connecticut. Ah. And we told him his name is Glenn Barbour. <laughs> you know? okay. So okay. I said, so you're putting that on me. <laughs> But you know what that was? That was a sign that they have confidence in me. Right. Okay. You see, they have exactly. confidence in me. Exactly. And so what I tried to do, uh, in addition to uh, trying to be a leader in the newsroom, mm. it was very difficult, don't get me wrong, mm. Okay, because there were a lot of people who didn't like the fact Want that I was there. To be there, the exactly. Yeah. Uh, but that didn't bother me because mm. what I was more concerned about was my wife Mm. And my two young children. Mm. Mm. Okay, my home. Okay. Okay, my wife had retired as a flight attendant. Mm -hmm. Okay, so she was a stay-at-home mom. Mm -hmm. So everything was on me. Okay. So there wasn't anybody out there mm. that, other than the Lord mm. that I was going to let get in the way of my family. Okay. You see what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you to say that one more time because that is so important Yeah. because so many of our young people, again, will come up against 
uh, an obstacle or barrier mm -hmm. and um, just either back off or, or give up, yeah. you know. But I, I, I like what you said, and, and the, just, just say one more time, you know, just so that our young people can hear that. Yeah. Okay. Well, you can't, you, you know, you can't let anything, you can't let them mm -hmm. come between you and your family. Okay. My family, you know, you know, when I, I there's some friends who are, are here in Orlando now, as ironic as it, we mm. worked at NBC together. Mm. And one is an attorney in town. Mm. And he was a unit manager with NBC Sports. Okay. And it was just ironic that we, we, we live here okay. together. And mm. we talk a lot about back in the day. Mm -hmm. And one of the things is that um, if you don't want me coming to your house for dinner, I don't want to go. Mm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And please mm. don't misunderstand me. Because I'm not inviting you to mine either. Mm, mm, okay, mm -hmm. you know right. my whole mission is I have a wife and I have two children. Right. I'm going to keep them fed. Okay, I'm going to keep a roof over their head. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can withstand. I can endure the nonsense down there at Thirty Rock. Okay, and I'm certainly not going to let it get in the way. And when I, I would know. when I would come home into Connecticut on the weekends. Man, it was great. Mm, mm -hmm. I mean, we used to go, we used to do things, and then it reached a point whereas uh, I was doing so well and get so many accolades, mm -hmm. till when they had the lighting of the Christmas tree, mm. they invited me to bring my daughter, my son. Uh, they invited all okay. of us to come there. Okay. Um, uh, the people at Radio City Music Hall, which is right across the street, got okay. to know us so well. Uh, oh, till when they had the Christmas show, I, this is this is the God's honest truth. Mm -hmm. They gave us a whole row, just me and my wife and our oh, two my. kids. Yes, and the place was packed, okay. and there was this whole row. It was just the four of us sitting in the row. Okay, okay, that's because it was earned. Yes, yes. the respect, and I say this to yeah. young people, earned that. Right. Okay, and and again, not to interrupt you, but. Uh, one of the things that I think um, you know we've learned at, at this age is that nothing at, you know worthwhile is given to you. No. Those things that are, are that are worthwhile are truly earned. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you know, it's one of the things. Um, my wife and I, uh, we've been married for uh, coming up on thirty-eight years. Okay. Thirty-eight uninterrupted years. Congratulations. Okay, we've never I, I, been estranged. I, I, I like you said. I like it. How but, you emphasize that but, uninterrupted part? But see, okay. I want to ask. Like, I want to ask. Did he? Did he get it right? Oh, oh, oh. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, hey, listen. So you learned over. I know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. But actually, you know what? Um, Dr. Robinson always hear me say this. There's always a show in a show mm. because there are so many things that you covered exactly. that we want to invite you back to talk about those things. Oh, absolutely. Okay? But I'm going to tell Dr. Robinson one of the main reasons that I want you to come on the show was that because um, I see that we're running out of time. Mm -hmm. I wanted you True. to talk about the July Perry mm -hmm. and uh, why did you decide to write that play and tell a, a little bit of history about July Perry, mm -hmm. and that, that's probably a show by itself. Mm -hmm. But also the second play that, well, I, I, I know you've written more more than two, but the one that was uh, that w was last week, Shades of Slavery. Uh, Shades mm -hmm. of Slavery. Mm -hmm. But can you briefly um, go into well, what inspired you to to write the 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 plays? Did you, did oh, you, oh, I'm sorry. Let, yeah, let, 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 let me do a little segue okay, in, okay. into it, etc. Okay, okay. And 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 this is very important mm -hmm. because. One of the things that Charles and I talked about is the 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 the, the history uh, in cen of Central Florida and race relations. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, one of our most recent episodes is the Trayvon Martin uh, mm -hmm. incident, and mm -hmm. in Jacksonville, the uh, Michael Dunn incident. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. talking about July Perry, um, one of the first things that I heard in coming into the area, and I knew nothing about Orlando. Mm -hmm was that um, they said, uh, uh, they as in the real estate folks, they said, well, you know, um, there's a little place called Okoe, mm -hmm. okay? And they said, uh, uh, I don't know if you want to stay out there. Now, mm -hmm. this was a black real estate agent mm -hmm. because they've got an interesting history, okay? 
But interestingly, uh, she wouldn't say more than they had an interesting history. But what I learned later on, uh, and and uh, as as you know, uh, you'll talk about, is what is referred to historically as the Okoe massacre. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and and I'm just going to uh, let you take over from there. Mm -hmm. But I just want to uh, let our audience know that there, you know, was uh, an incident there, 1920. 1920. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, that's still recorded as the largest uh, civilian death, um, you know, uh, uh, due to racial violence, mm -hmm. supposedly, uh, although there's been some other uh, incidents have been recorded. Mm -hmm. uh, and they never keep accurate figures of this. Mm -hmm. But in this little community that I don't think that without your having put a, uh, uh, an emphasis on it, I don't think many people would have known exactly what had happened. So well, you know, let me say this. First of all, today, Okoe is a tale of two cities. Mm. Okay. Um, I had, uh, now, I'm not from here either, mm. okay, you know. Okay. And, but I had heard some rumblings about what happened back then. Mm -hmm. uh, what really uh, uh, brought this to my attention was the recent voter suppression. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking about it. I started hearing about it. And I woke up one morning and I wanted to write a play and, and, and I really didn't know what I was going to write about. Mm -hmm. Something popped up in my mind. A mm. Koei. Mm. And I said, oh, okay. So I got together with my daughter and I called the History Center. Mm -hmm. They have an archival department. They have archivists there. Mm -hmm. You can call them and you can tell them what you want and stuff. And so we went up there and they have a little room like a library. Mm. And we went up there and they had just tons of stuff laid out about that. Mm. E I mean, even July Perry's death certificate oh my. was there. Okay, and mm. I, newspaper articles and, and and they won't let you take any, but you can make copies. Right. Okay. Right. And we took all these copies and stuff, and so I have a young lady who helps me out a lot with the plays I write. And she found somebody, and I called them, and they gave us some information. And I started learning more and more. And I, and I started thinking, well, wait a minute. Now, they said Negroes back then couldn't vote because they had paid their polling taxes. Mm. Okay. Today, mm -hmm. they're trying to suppress us by telling us you got to have birth certificates to get these licenses, you got to have this and right. that and that. Mm -hmm. That's remnants in, uh, back then. Right. So I just started, you know, looking. I was going online. I was reading all kinds of stuff about July Perry. And I got a lead. And, you know, as a news person, you know how to dig. Mm -hmm. You know okay. how to dig. So I got a lead. And I was actually able to find mm -hmm. July Perry's granddaughter. Oh my. Whose mother was in the house the night the Klan came and got him and hanged him. Oh my. Her mother was in the house that night. Mm. And so I found him. So I talked to them and I told them what I was doing. I told them I was a writer and, and, and I wanted to write this play. And um, so we, I, I, you know, I kept talking to them and I kept talking to them. Mm. And they were they were in the Tampa area, mm -hmm. so I asked if I could come visit, mm -hmm. and they said yes. So my wife and I went to visit them, oh, okay. and we sat down in uh, their home, and uh, the granddaughter, whose mother, as I said, was July Perry's daughter, right. she told us that uh, after many many years, mm. her mom never would talk about what happened that night, mm. but shortly before her death. She told him what told happened. Him. Oh my! And we sat in the living room and we listened to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, as a writer, my head is is full now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But what I wanted to know, I said, now what am I going to call this? Mm -hmm. And so I came with the name, the July Perry story, is the journey in reverse. Okay. okay. Yeah. That's what I call. It. Is the journey is in the reverse? Is the journey in reverse? Is it going backwards? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so um, I talked to some people, went to Okoe, talked to some people in Okoe. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you know, this is a true story. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, one day 
there's 500 and some Negroes living in the Koei, mm. the next day ain't none. <laughs> right. What happened? Mm. Mm. And the Klan said, if you go to try to vote, Bartley Hum will come to you. Mm. Now, there were some white people that you talked to, they'd say, well, it didn't exactly happen that way. <laughs> well, how did yeah, it happen? Of, of course. <laughs> you, okay. know, you know, you know, you know. So, you know, it's like people who read the Bible. Everybody has a different interpretation of the same verse. Verse. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, I, you know, I, I, I started reading things and I started reading things and I, and I said, you know, there's this guy, July Perry, and his buddy, his name escapes me right now. Mm -hmm. But, you know, July Perry was a fairly well-off mm -hmm. uh, Negro man. And, um, you know, when white people wanted black people, they would come to him, right. okay? So when it came time to vote for president, the general election, mm -hmm. okay, when black people who had paid their polling taxes mm -hmm. went to vote, they told him, you didn't pay your polling taxes. Hmm. They were turning them away. Sounds like some stuff that's been happening recently. <laughs> that's why I'm saying <laughs> okay. it's the journey in reverse. Yes, exactly. You see what I'm saying? Right. You know, and um, but I must say that when, you know, I wrote the play and I, I, I did the casting, I got everybody together. Mm -hmm. We went through the rehearsals and we had, uh, you know, a lot of radio, a lot of radio. We went on a lot of radio shows mm -hmm. talking about it. Our church was just, you just couldn't, we couldn't put any more people in there mm. on that day. Mm -hmm. And our sanctuary holds a thousand. Mm. And there were people out in the vestibule. We had to open up the walls in it because people wow. wanted to see this. And the interesting thing about it is that, you know, the new part mm -hmm. of Ocoee mm -hmm. is more of a bedroom community of Orlando. Right, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so a lot of those people, man, had no idea. They're going, what? Mm -hmm. What are you talking about? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a lot of the land mm -hmm. still today in Ocoee mm -hmm. was taken by white people. Mm -hmm. Blacks owned those land. Okay. Okay, and the whites took that land. Oh. And, 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 and as I met with some lawyers, they said, now, you know, it's white people aren't going to give that land up today. You can forget about that. Mm, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so um, I was able to uh, bring the granddaughter and her family. They came in, and after a certain part of the play, I introduced them, and the grandmother and her son came up, and the grandmother told the audience what her mother, because her mother was shot that night by the Klan. Oh, my. Yeah, she wasn't yeah. killed. Right. But she was she shot. Was shot. Mm -hmm. mm. And she talked and told them what her mother told her. Mm. And, and that is as close to that mm -hmm. as you're ever going to get. Exactly. Yeah. That's as close as you're ever going to get. You know, and, you know, I got a call one day from somebody who was in Miami. Mm. And they said, we heard about that. Mm -hmm. Down here in Miami. Mm. Okay. And uh, my dream is to turn that into a movie. Okay. Because the movie that was made about um, Rosewood. Rosewood, yes, this is worse than that. Than a, ex yeah. Okay. A this is exactly. worse than that. Yeah. Okay. And I'll tell you something that's ironic. Mm. I did, a, I did a play Sunday, this past Sunday, uh, Slaves, uh, Shades of Slavery, mm -hmm. Time of Remembrance. Mm. When I got home that night, mm. the granddaughter of one of July Perry's friends called me. Oh, I, was, I was tired, I was sleeping, yeah. the telephone rang, and, I said, uh -huh. and she said, hey, Mr. Barbour, I said, and she said, this is Olivia, she said, I'm so and so high time with his granddaughter. I said, really? Mm. And I'm thinking of all times. Yes. Okay. Exactly. God has a funny way of telling you things. Yes. You know what Ex I'm saying? Amen. Yes. You know, but it was it was uh, 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 the July Perry story is a story that needs to be told. Absolutely. It really mm -hmm. it really needs to be told because mm -hmm. they killed a lot of, they killed a lot of people. Mm, okay. Mm -hmm. On that night, the, the, the election night. Mm, right. And th that was a, 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 the 1920 presidential election. That is correct. The okay. general election. Right. The general okay. election. Yes. yes. And, and what happened when they, when they came 
that came to July Perry's house because mm-hmm. he voted. Mm-hmm. He voted. They didn't let his friend vote, mm-hmm. but he voted, and they came to get him. Right. Okay. Okay. And they were going to shoot up his house, mm-hmm. and he his family got out. And though his 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 daughter was wounded, mm-hmm. and he went outside, mm-hmm. and he was he was shooting at him. Okay. And he killed a couple of them. Oh, okay. And that's when they took him mm-hmm. and put him under arrest. Mm-hmm. Took him to a jail in Orlando. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then they claimed that a bunch of people came and got him out there and hung him downtown. Mm-hmm. Hung him okay. in the tree downtown. Just, just happen to be able to break him out of jail. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. So I th- I thought that it was it was important to tell that story. No, okay. I, absolutely. Um, the the recent play, Shades of Slavery, Time of Remembrance. Mm-hmm. Hold on a second, Glenn. I, I, I didn't set. I was trying to set it up, but what I'm going to do is for about uh, 50 seconds. You you're not able to see it. I tried to set it up, but I didn't check it. But I'm going to run right now. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> what what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a clip, and the clip is the old man coming out. Oh. And he, they're putting him on stage. So I'm oh. going to run that real quick. You okay. can't see it, but I'm going to let you know what it is. Okay. And I'm going to let you know that I'm running it right now okay. so the people can see it. Okay. But um, they're, they're, he's, he's, he's coming out, mm-hmm. and they're helping him. Um, out of the wheelchair? Right. Uh-huh. And as a matter of fact, you can go ahead and talk over it, but okay. I'll let you know when it ends. What? But you can explain okay. what's going the on. The interesting thing about this old man, his name is Daphne Jefferson. Mm. He was born July 4th, 1903, mm. on the Jefferson Plantation in Mason County, Virginia. Okay. His mama, Lizzie, and Jeremiah Jefferson, they were born on the same plantation mm. in 1868. Mm. Their parents, uh, uh, Isaiah and Daisy Jefferson, were born on the plantation in 1843. Okay. 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 Uh, what happened was that the Jefferson family today, 2014, mm-hmm. they were doing a search of their history. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, two family members went to Mason County, Virginia, mm-hmm. and they they went to the Hall of Records, right. and they discovered the 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 the, the Jefferson. Mm-hmm. But the difficulty, the difficulty they had mm-hmm. was that all the Negroes on the plantation, they all had the same last name. Uh, of Je- Jefferson. Of, uh, right, of the right. master. Right. The master, okay. master last name. Uh-huh. But they came across Dabner mm-hmm. because their name was there. It was Dabner the second, Dabner the third, Dabner oh, the fourth. Okay. okay. So that's how they knew. So they mm-hmm. traced that back. Right. But they were able to find death records of everybody but the old man who was born July 4th, 1903. Mm. They could not find it. Mm -hmm. So to them, they thought, well, maybe he's still alive. Mm -hmm. But that means he's nearly 111 years old. Right, right. Okay. They searched, they searched, they searched everywhere they couldn't. And one day, uh, Dabner IV uh, was at a red light. Mm-hmm. And he happened to look up and he saw the Amazing Grace Veterans Home for the Aging. Oh. And he had a hunch. He said, well, let me go in there. What the heck? We searched everywhere else. Why not? Mm-hmm. So he goes in there and he goes to this lady behind the desk and he says, listen, I'm trying to find a long lost relative of mine. Mm-hmm. And she said, well, what is his name? He said, Dabner Jefferson. Mm-hmm. She said, Mr. Dabner. Oh. She said, we all know him. He's the oldest resident we have here. My. And he said, I can't believe what I'm here. Are you sure? Mm-hmm. She said, I'm absolutely sure. But just in case, she went on the computer mm-hmm. and it popped up. Admitted, May 12th, 1992. Mm-hmm. Dabner Jefferson, born July 4th, 1903 in Mason County, Virginia. The he, same this, there you go. All okay, right. and so uh, what happened was that here's a man who has been in that home mm. since 1992. Never had any visitors. Oh my! Never knew nothing. Yeah, yeah. Never knew nothing. 
didn't even know he had any kid folk. My goodness. And they went there and they saw him. Mm. Okay. And remember, he's, he's nearly 111 right. years old. Yeah. But what I wanted people to hear was him tell what he remembers. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And his story would really blow your mind because mm -hmm. when he was a young man on the plantation, mm -hmm. remember in 1865, slavery was abolished, mm -hmm. but right. the practice continued. Okay. Okay. That, For many years. And, and that's something that is, is definitely been under, uh, under the radar. There you go. For that's many right. years. Okay. That's right. And so, He's now, he met, he met a pretty girl mm -hmm. on the plantation named Lily Mae. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. They got married. Okay. They had two children. Mm -hmm. Okay. Lil Dabner and Charlotte Mae. Mm. So now he's in his early 20s. Mm -hmm. And his mama and daddy encouraged him to go north. Mm. Take your family north. Mm -hmm. Okay. And mama made him big, some food, they packed their clothes, oh, yeah. that old horse, oh, okay. and they had a, a carriage and the kids, and they left late one night, mm -hmm. a beautiful night, mm -hmm. and they took a back road, heading north, mm -hmm. and, and, and Lily Mae could sing, mm -hmm. oh there he's riding, they, oh, so there the kids laying down there and the stuff, and she's singing, and then all of a sudden, she said, what's that noise? Mm. Horses. Mm -hmm. and they're getting closer and closer. And that old horse that they had couldn't go but so fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was a bunch of men mm -hmm. dressed in nothing but white mm. surrounded them. Mm -hmm. Okay. A, a few of them got off their horse and put a gun to Dabner's head. Mm -hmm. His wife, Lily Mae, was pregnant mm -hmm. with the third child. Mm -hmm. They took her mm -hmm. and they told him, you get, or I'm gonna kill you and them other two children. Mm -hmm. And they took Lily Mae mm -hmm. and they went off in the horse. As far as they could go, Lily May, he could, I could hear her screaming like it was yesterday. Yeah. Okay, they took her, never saw her again. Don't even know what happened to his unborn child. Mm -hmm. They got as far as they could go. Mm -hmm. They had, they, they were hungry. Mm -hmm. And he went into this store. And he stole a jar of jam and a jar of peanut butter. Mm -hmm. And the white man caught him. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they know we hang niggas mm -hmm. for this. Mm -hmm. But there was an uppity black man in the store. Mm -hmm. He paid the white man. Mm -hmm. And the white man let him go. Mm -hmm. And they walked outside and he saw the two children. And they were so hungry. Mm -hmm. Because cause when, when those men in white stopped them, they not only took the food, but they took their clothes. So they took everything. They took everything. Mm. They took everything. Mm. And so the uppity Negro man mm. asked him, how is he going to feed them children? How is he going to take care of the children? Mm. I'll give you $5 for them. Mm. And he took his children, and the uppity Negro man mm. took his children. Mm -hmm. Okay, and he went off. And as I say to people, you know something? Many black people from that era mm -hmm. were institutionalized mm -hmm. for mental illness, mm -hmm. mental retardation, depression, and anger. Mm -hmm. But they were all misdiagnosed. Mm -hmm. You know why? because their hearts were shattered. Yeah. Yeah. They had broken hearts, yeah. man, because yeah. of the atrocities and the tragedies that had happened to them. Yeah. And this old man had come back to his family, his kinfolks, 
when they went into the into the old folks home mm. and, and, and and the nurse told him, Mr. Dabner, you have visitors. Mm -hmm. And he turned and said, Lily Mae? Oh my. Lily Mae, is that you? You come to get me? Mm. Okay. Mm. And they told him, We're your kin folks. He said, You mean I have kin folks? And they brought him to the house that day. So the generations from four years old, his son that was taken away from him yeah. at six years old mm -hmm. was there. He hadn't seen his father in 85 years. Oh, my. And he went up to him and he said, Daddy, mm. I'm Dabna. Mm. He said, you're my little boy, Dabna? He said, yeah. He mm -hmm. said, where's your sister? Where's Charlotte May? They said, Daddy, Charlotte May is dead. Mm. And then he started going, I'm so sorry. Mm. Please forgive me. And then he went, proceeded to tell his story. Okay. okay. That is something that, again, when I go back to, and I said earlier about mm. when we first came over here in 1619. Right. Okay. That's part of our history. Everybody Absolutely. else have somebody like that man. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. And that's the kind of stuff you're not going to be taught in the classroom. Right. It's not in a book. Absolutely. So as a writer, I feel it's incumbent upon me mm. to try to let people know. And this was a mm. short story, by the way. Mm -hmm. I wrote it as a short story. Mm. It's only two acts. The wow. first act was setting up his yeah. arrival. Yeah. Okay, his yeah. visit. Exactly. Okay, exactly. that's what it was. And they were talking about how they went searching for their family and how they found him and, mm. and stuff. And then the day, as Charles was just mentioning, when you saw them pushing him in in the wheelchair. Mm. Okay. And he's come up there and he's telling the story. And in fact, I got to tell you something. Mm -hmm. My wife and I, we were talking about this. Um, we had him made up like an old, you know, like mm -hmm. a, oh, no, very old man. Mm -hmm. And at the end, he said, that old sweet chariot that swings so low mm -hmm. can now come forth to carry me home. Mm -hmm. Lord, precious Lord, mm -hmm. take my okay. hand, let me stand, lead me on. on. Okay. okay. Yes. And so we had this, we found this really moving song by Mahalia Jackson called Precious Lord. Mm. Oh, yes. And, and, and they lifted him up and they carried him off. They helped him walk down. And I wanted him to go out into the audience, by the way, to touch people. Mm. I was sitting there in the first row, and I happened to turn around when he was walking up a few rows. And I had the um, the nurses; they were dressed in their nurses', nurses. outfit, helping him. Mm -hmm. And there were people sliding over to touch him. Mm. They wanted to touch him because they were in the moment. Yes, they were in the moment. Exactly. Okay. And one of the guys who was a nurse told me later, he said, "You should have seen." Mm -hmm. wiping their face mm. and then he got back to the end and he was getting ready to sit down in a wheelchair and he put his hand up to his mouth and he threw them all a kiss Oh! and they gave a round of applause to him okay. yes and you know that, as you mentioned uh, about uh, the audience being in the moment um, a as a psychologist um, the, there is a, a, a concept of the, 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 the connectivity, the, the sense of uh, us as human beings being connected across space and across time. Mm -hmm. And when you mention that, um, that moment seems to have broken down the space and time mm -hmm. so that those individuals, even though they weren't there, their stories may have been different but they could feel that human connectedness there you go. That's you know, right. to, to, to that story. That's right. You know, yeah. so, so I think that it is so important that um, our young people, and I keep on coming back to our young people, know that not only that those stories are, have been lived, but that they're still alive. And, and I, I have to say that um, a, as, a, as a newsman, et cetera, uh, one of the things that flashed through my head is that um, you really are more than that. And I go back to the uh, archetypal uh, image or, or, or title of Griot, mm. that, uh, that the, 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 the history keeper, 
um, the, the transmitter of, of the ancestor stories mm -hmm. that, um, that often in uh, African society is a revered position. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I look at you, Glenn, as, the, if you want to call it, a modern-day Griot, yeah, oh, okay? Right. <laughs> and uh, both keeping that sense of what connects us and telling that story in a way that the generations that follow know that there is some connection between those ancestors, the present time, and those who are to come. Yeah. So, yeah. But, I but you, you know, in, in this play, Shades of Slavery, Time of Remembrance, had a lot of young people in the play. Mm. Okay. And a lot of them asking questions. Mm -hmm. And when, when in the play, and when one of the, the, the characters, one of the fathers, said uh, that um, uh, most of all of the slaves had the same last name mm -hmm. as a master. So this young kid said, you mean to tell me our last name Jefferson came from a white man? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, you. And, and, and so, so it, 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 but, but again, you had a lot of uh, young uh, kids out there in that audience that felt the same as he. Yes. Okay. And so one of the things that I, I know already, and, and Charles said at the beginning, we're definitely going to have to have you come back. Okay, absolutely. Because yeah. there is so much more to, to this story. Yeah. And so we, we run short on time, mm -hmm. uh, as, and as it is with, uh, with a good uh, a storyteller, mm -hmm. that you want to hear more. So we're going to invite you back in okay. the near future right. to continue the story. All right. And so family, we have to leave you now. But uh, again, thank you for being with us this Friday night. Uh, and uh, hopefully our uh, broadcast tonight has told you a lot about the journey from me to you and from you to me. Good night. We'll see you next week.